Hello, on behalf of the Indiana University Department of Radiology, I'd like to welcome you to this short presentation on MRI contrast safety, which was initially presented at a resident didactic conference in January 2013. The purpose of this presentation is to present material principally found in the ACR manual on contrast safety for core examination purposes. Many different substances and compounds have been used to produce either positive or negative contrast in MR studies. By far the most common is gadolinium. Gadolinium is an element, a rare earth metal, which has been approved for use since the 1980s. Uh, the gadolinium 3 plus ion is actually toxic to humans, and in order to uh, make it suitable for use as a contrast agent, the gadolinium 3 plus ion needs to be compounded with other agents known as chelating agents in order to make it stable and safe. The seven unpaired electrons in gadolinium's outer shell make it particularly suitable for producing contrast on T1 weighted images by shortening the T1 relaxation time in the tissues where gadolinium distributes. Several of the most common gadolinium based contrast agents are demonstrated on this slide. As discussed briefly, each individual contrast agent is made up of the gadolinium 3 plus ion surrounded by an organic compound known as the chelating agent. These compounds are typically administered in a standard dose for imaging purposes, somewhere in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimoles per kilogram. Adverse events as well as allergic reactions have been associated with gadolinium-based contrast agents. When compared with iodinated contrast agents used for CT examinations, gadolinium-based contrast agents are generally associated with a lower rate of adverse events as well as allergic reactions. For adverse events, that rate is somewhere on the order of 0.07 to 2.4% when used at the standard doses previously indicated. These events can include anything from cold at the injection site to nausea, vomiting, headache, warmth or pain at the injection site, paresthesias, dizziness, and itching. True allergic responses to gadolinium-based contrast agents are quite rare and occur at a much lower rate than adverse events, somewhere on the order of 0.004 to 0.7% when used at the standard doses. As you might anticipate, these responses include rash, hives, urticaria, bronchospasm, and in very, very rare circumstances, true anaphylaxis. The specific treatment protocols for both adverse events and allergic responses to gadolinium-based contrast agents are essentially identical to those for iodinated contrast agents and will not be covered in this presentation. For more information regarding these specific protocols, please refer to the ACR manual on contrast safety. Several risk factors for both adverse events and allergic reactions have been identified. Probably the most significant is a history of prior reaction to a gadolinium-based contrast agent. The published data on this suggests that there's an approximate eight-fold increase for a second either adverse event or allergic response in someone who has had at least one gadolinium-based contrast agent reaction. In addition, atopic conditions such as allergies and asthma, allergy to iodinated contrast material, and heart disease also increase one's risk for adverse reactions. In addition to the adverse responses and allergic reactions already discussed, there are certain risks associated with gadolinium-based contrast agents, which appear to be directly related to poor renal function there's an important distinction to be made between gadolinium-based contrast agents and their association with renal function and that which exists between iodinated contrast agents and poor renal function. Iodinated contrast agents tend to exacerbate renal failure or at least have the potential to do so. Gadolinium-based contrast agents have no direct nephrotoxic effect. Another way of stating that is to say that giving a gadolinium based contrast agent to a patient with renal failure will not worsen the renal failure. The reason we worry about giving gadolinium to a patient with renal failure 
is the risk of developing nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which will be discussed briefly. It's important to recognize that nephrogenic systemic fibrosis typically develops only in patients with severe renal failure. Certain risk factors for the development of NSF have been identified and they include a GFR less than 30, patients on dialysis, and those with acute kidney injury. It's important to remember that Underlying chronic renal failure is not a prerequisite for the development of NSF, and this condition can be seen in patients with isolated acute kidney injury only. The classic clinical manifestations of NSF include skin thickening and contractures, often within the extremities and around joints, as depicted here. These clinical manifestations typically develop within weeks of exposure to gadolinium. However, there are several case reports of patients developing these signs and symptoms up to years after their exposure. There appears to be a positive correlation between the development of NSF and the number of exposures to gadolinium. Although the condition is rare, it's important to remember that it is not reversible and that there is no effective treatment, often leaving patients with severe disability. The exact pathophysiology underlying the development of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is a subject of debate. Several theories have been put forth to explain how gadolinium-based contrast agents in the setting of severe renal dysfunction can lead to the development of NSF. Probably the most prevalent of the theories is based on the idea that the gadolinium chelates are inherently unstable and with time will actually dissociate into the chelate backbone and free gadolinium 3 plus ions. Once the gadolinium ion has dissociated from the chelating agent, it forms complexes with circulating anions, phosphates being one example. These newly formed complexes then deposit into soft tissues and incite an inflammatory response, which includes the recruitment of fibroblasts, which deposit excessive collagen, leading to the characteristic skin thickening and contractures. Since essentially all patients who develop nephrogenic systemic fibrosis suffer from some degree of renal failure, typically very severe renal failure, it's important to understand some of the risk factors associated with renal failure. These include an age over 60, and a history of renal disease of essentially any type, but most specifically patients with a history of dialysis, transplant, a single kidney, a prior history of kidney surgery or renal cancer. In addition, patients with hypertension requiring medication therapy and those with a history of diabetes are also at risk for renal failure. Questions often arise regarding the timing of renal function testing in patients with risk factors for renal failure as it pertains to contrast-enhanced MR imaging. The following is a table taken from the ACR manual on contrast safety, which outlines different categories based on the patient's most recent GFR measurement. Perhaps the best way to summarize the table is to say that a patient with a prior GFR less than 60 or anyone with a condition that could result in acute kidney injury should be tested within two weeks of contrast administration and that those with a GFR historically less than 30 should be tested within one week of contrast administration. Specific guidelines regarding the administration of gadolinium contrast agents in dialysis patients is generally lacking and many people will have to refer to specific guidelines as set forth by their individual institutions. Here at Indiana University, the following are the recommendations for patients on dialysis undergoing contrast-enhanced MR studies. The first is to consider an alternative means of imaging. 
Perhaps the clinical question could be answered via a CT or ultrasound examination in place of an MR study. If an MR study is to be pursued, dialysis is recommended immediately after contrast administration, and a second run should be performed 24 hours after administration of the contrast agent, after which a normal dialysis routine is resumed. To end the discussion on gadolinium-based contrast agents, we will consider a couple of special situations, namely gadolinium contrast agents in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Questions often arise regarding the safety of gadolinium agents in pregnant women. Generally, gadolinium contrast agents are contraindicated in pregnant women. It is known that gadolinium passes from the maternal circulation into the amniotic fluid. Contrast collecting within the amniotic fluid could undergo the same dissociation reaction discussed previously into the chelating agent and free gadolinium ion. It is reasonable to think that the free gadolinium ion could have toxic effects upon the developing fetus. However, there are situations where the benefits of a contrast enhanced MR study may outweigh the potential risks associated with gadolinium contrast agents in pregnant women. The American College of Radiology has published the following statement in regards to gadolinium contrast agents in pregnant women. Each case should be reviewed carefully and gadolinium-based contrast agents administered only when there is a potential significant benefit to the patient or fetus that outweighs the possible risk of exposure of the fetus to free gadolinium ions. In general, gadolinium-based contrast agents are safe for administration in women who are breastfeeding. The general recommendation is that there is no need to stop breastfeeding for any length of time. It is true that gadolinium is excreted into the breast milk and subsequently passed on to the infant. However, the concentrations of gadolinium are so low that they are felt to be clinically insignificant. Clearly, the level of comfort amongst women will differ greatly, and some women may choose to voluntarily discontinue breastfeeding for a length of time. For those who do, there really is no benefit to discontinuing beyond 24 hours. This concludes our presentation. Hopefully you have found this short review to be helpful as a basic review of MR contrast safety. Thank you.